Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anne Ellis. I'm the CEO of Move Group. Uh, we're an organisation that supports companies who want to expand overseas, and we offer a variety of services, including employment of record, uh, company setup, payroll and accounting, immigration, and all sorts of advice on HR, employment laws, and tax liabilities in the different locations. So I'm very pleased to be here today with the panelists who are experts in their own field and have come here to join us from four different locations. So our discussion today is based on providing you with an insight into the opportunities that some countries are offering to companies. Uh, we'd also like to highlight some of the challenges that companies can face in certain locations and hopefully offer solutions which can help you to overcome those challenges. I'm very interested to hear about the current trends and opportunities. I was personally involved in the global expansion of our own organisation in the first 10 years. So I'd like to start with Juan Daniel Rodriguez, who is joining us today from Mexico. Daniel, could you tell us what the current trends and opportunities are in your marketplace? Yeah, uh, thank you, Anne. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Centuro, for the invitation. Uh, well, I'm based in Mexico City, but uh, considering the topic, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Lat Latin American region. Yeah. And I, uh, I think uh, we can summarize uh, uh, the trends into two very different uh, 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 topics, no? The first one, uh, I can call it, it's, it's a transformation, okay? Uh, a, a huge transformation in, in, in the economy, in the region, driven by, by technology companies, no? And in this, in this regard, uh, a figure that um, may sound uh, very weird is that according to Crunchbase and to the Miami Herald, in 2021, Latin America, Latin America, Latam region, was the fastest uh, growing region in the world for startup companies. Okay, um, in that in that single year, uh, venture capital investors uh, poured around closely uh, to 20 billion US dollars in startup companies. Uh, this is uh, three times more than than the amount of money that was invested uh, in the whole region in 2020. And um, this created, uh, we, are, we have currently in the, air, in the region around uh, 6,000 startup companies uh, born, in, born in Latin America, founded by, by young uh, in, uh, Latin American entrepreneurs. And uh, well, the, the, the trend in this year is, is, is still more or less the same, no? Um, this has transformed the market because uh, of, by, it, 2018, we had two, two or three unicorns in the, in the region. By the end of 2020, we have 34. And uh, I think at least a couple of, of new unicorns in, in this 2022. So uh, certainly that, that's, that is changing you know, uh, uh, the way of doing business, the way of relating with people, the, the growth of companies, etc. Uh, as, as a little background for, for you to have an idea, uh, Latin America is integrated by 33 countries, okay? And we are talking about a 700 million population. Uh, most of them uh, under 40 years old. So the market is very different to the market in Europe or in Asia or in, in other regions. And the second trend that I, that I want to talk about is um, I should call it the, uh, the first one was transformation, and the second one it's like a, a relocation. You know? um, and this is this is driven more uh, by a geopolitical uh, situation, uh, and it's more focused on Mexico and, and maybe some some countries in in Central America. Uh, the situ the this si geopolitical situation, policy the politics between the the U.S. and and China, have created uh, or, or have a oblige the companies, the U.S. companies, to think twice about having uh, manufacturing plants or, or its supply chain uh, uh, in China or in other countries in, in Asia. And now they are, they are uh, relocating or trying to, to, to have uh, their manufacturing plants, their assembly units, 
or all the supply chain that they need for, for their processes in, in, in more friendly jurisdictions. And, and certainly Mexico is it's, it's a very good alternative for them. No? We have 3,000 uh, kilometers of, of borderline. We share uh, three uh, time zones. Uh, we have a free trade agreement with them for, for the last 30 years that was recently um, reviewed, refreshed, no, uh, during the Trump administration. And um, well, we have uh, tax treaties, no, so uh, you avoid uh, double taxation. Taxes that are paid in Mexico are credited in the, in the U.S. So uh, that, I think th those are the two main uh, uh, important trends that we are, we are uh, seeing in the region. So how would you say that's going to impact on the opportunities for companies coming from overseas? You say there's a massive growth in, in the local countries. How is that going to, is that going to help companies that are coming in from outside? Yes, a lot of companies are, are, are investing and, 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 and being incorporated in Mexico. Uh, because of the advantages that we offer as a jurisdiction, but also because of the easy access to the U.S. market, to the U.S. and Canadian market. I see. It's interesting. It's, it's really good news to hear about the massive growth. It's a, it's a region that's very, I really particularly like myself, so I'm happy to hear about that. Um, now I'd like to go over to Marie, um, who has spent, she's based in the Middle East, and she spent 15 years there developing her organisation, of which she is the co-owner and managing director. Marie, can you tell us if there are any particular notable trends, developments in the UAE at the moment? Yes, thank you, Anne. Um, Dubai, the UAE, and, and particularly Dubai, the economy is booming at the moment, and that's for several reasons. Um, the main one being, you know, from the crisis, Dubai came out in a very positive light. Um, it handled the situation very well. There weren't very big lockdowns. Um, the, government, the government managed the whole crisis extremely well. Um, so we're seeing a lot of high net worth individuals moving to Dubai at the moment. Um, they're moving from places like Singapore, Hong Kong, UK, um, France, Switzerland. Okay. And basically, previously the high net worth individuals were investing in Dubai. Now we're seeing they're actually moving to Dubai. They want to live in Dubai. If there's a crisis, again, they want to be somewhere where the government handles the situation well. There's good medical facilities, good opportunities. We're seeing they're moving their family offices, um, moving them to Dubai, setting up structures in Dubai, managing them from Dubai. Um, and that, this has resulted in the property market, especially the high-end property market, is, you know, it's, it's booming at the moment. We can find properties for some of our clients. Um, the proper, properties have increased 50% in some areas in Dubai over the last two to three years, which is just crazy. Um, we also had the Expo 2020 from October 2021 to March 22, which bought, brought a lot of trade missions to Dubai from various countries and tourists. Again, sparked more interest and investment in Dubai. Um, so these are, I suppose, the, the key things that have factored to the economy booming and, and doing so well, well at the moment. Yeah. Well, it's obviously all about location with regards to Dubai and the appeal of working and living in the region. Actually, I'm a resident of Dubai myself, and I can reiterate what uh, Marie's telling us here. Um, now to go over to Teresa, who's based in Detroit in Michigan. And we know the US has always been an appealing destination for FDI companies. C Teresa, can you talk more on why that is? Yeah, thank you, Anne. Um, U.S. is a top uh, FDI destination because of the size of the market. Um, companies who need to expand outside their border are, are seeking that size market, but the size alone is an obstacle, but also can be an advantage. Um, to avoid it to becoming an obstacle, people need to access information and use information to make the right decisions to, um, because if you can imagine if location is, is key, the size of the U.S. is like, where do I locate? So um, they need to think about uh, things like, um, do they have stereotypes that may not be applicable? Just because you're a tech company doesn't mean you have to be on the West Coast. Um, just because you're not in the auto industry doesn't mean you shouldn't consider Michigan or Detroit because things have changed over the years. Um, I know people that I talk to in Europe still think uh, D the city of Detroit's in bankruptcy. Um, that's long over and there's very, very much a re revitalization going on before the pandemic and continuing. So 
Um, be careful of the stereotypes. Um, also, state incentives to locate in a region. Um, it's all at the state level, so there's 50 different programs um, that change frequently, so you need information about what's available in the areas you're considering. Um, you have to do your homework and understand where the industry and the potential customer concentrations are. And if you look at access to a workforce that has the skill sets you need in combination with access to the land you may need and things like power and the cost of power, um, you have to make all of those things work because you can't locate in a rural area because of the um, abundance of land if you're building an R&D center and you need to fill it with engineers. So they, they all have to come together. Um, I think that the good thing is, is that there is a lot of information and support available to people um, making these decisions. Uh, the economic development organizations at the state and regional level have international attraction programs. So they're seeking foreign companies to come into their area. They have incentives to bring jobs into the area, but as you can imagine with tech companies, the number of jobs is not as high as it would be for a manufacturing facility. So they have special incentives to bring tech companies and new industries into the areas as well. Um, the, uh, a couple of real quick examples is uh, the state of Michigan. It, earlier this year passed a $1 billion incentive package to use to bring transformational projects into Michigan. And another example that's a little unique, the federal government is currently in the process of um, identifying 20 to 30 <coughs> regional projects that would um, build uh, new industries or support new industry growth and they've got $1 billion to give out. The Detroit region is currently um, waiting on their application for $100 million to build uh, an advanced mo mobility uh, cluster. So um, a lot of great things going on, and those are, those are um, unique. The federal especially is unique, but every state has incentive packages, and um, information about those incentive packages is important to a company looking to come in. Um, next, you need to use your team of U.S. advisors, and they need to work together. For example, the, uh, a company needs to build a business plan for the U.S. that has the right costs in it, the costs of a payroll in the U.S., not their home country, the taxes that they might pay. And if you're building that business plan with your accountants, um, make it work for the immigration attorney as well, so working together. And another key thing um, when you're talking about locating and, and what you're going to be doing in the U.S. is use that team of advisors to talk about the different business models that you may use. I talk to a lot of companies that need to be or want to be in the U.S. and they don't know if they're going to have a sales office or they're going to distribute. Um, some people think it can just be a cost center. So use that team in the planning stage because it's going to affect your decision about location and facilities and all of that. And lastly, you know, leverage your network and, and resources. You know, Centro Global with the platform, the, the organization, the network, it's obviously we're all here for that reason. It's a perfect place to get that information to start making those decisions. Yeah, I noticed you also mentioned Select USA. Yes, Select USA is a federal program that um, they have an annual summit. It's coming up in, in the end of June. And I think every state and territory is represented, represented there from, from an economic development organization. I think there's about three or 4,000 people that attend and people from all over the world. It's the opportunity to have uh, meetings and talk to the people from all the different states. So a lot of people that come from outside the U.S. are in the very early planning stages and they're seeking to understand those very things. Where's the industry? Where are the incentives? Where's the workforce? And it's a great because you can talk to everybody all at once. That's really good, really interesting information. Thank you, Teresa. Going back to Marie now, uh, regarding the Dubai and the booming um, time they're having there. Also, I think uh, people have spoken about Dubai as being a difficult place because of the tax situation there, but I think they're changing that now, aren't they, Marie? Yeah, so there's been a few new incentives and changes then. Um, and firstly, the introduction of corporation tax, 
which was announced actually three weeks after I did a management buyout to the company, and I thought, God, I missed the boat there. But all jokes aside, it's actually been a very positive thing um, because it will align Dubai and the UAE with the rest of the world. It's 9%, so it's not a large corporation tax when you compare to other cities and countries around the world. Um, so that's been one incentive and change recently. They've also introduced that um, the majority of mainland activities can now be 100% owned by a foreign investor. Previously, you had to have a local sponsor, which in paper owned 51% of your company. So the elimination of that, of course, is very attractive for foreign investors. Yeah. Um, they've also launched a lot of new visa categories. So you've got the 10-year golden visa. We've had a lot of Indian nationals um, move from India with the option of that 10-year visa. The retirement visa, there's now actually an option for people to stay on when they have worked in Dubai for 10, 15, 20 years. They now have an option to stay on. Um, there's the property visa, which is the one and five-year property <laughs> visa, which is, again, quite attractive. And, of course, the digital um, working nomad visa, um, which has been very popular as well recently. Yeah, that's all good news, because when we set up in Dubai, this was in 2007, I think we had to invest $80,000 just to start up the company. So it was a big investment at that time, and definitely... There's a lot so. more options and a lot cheaper now, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> we, do, we, we did it too early then. Mm -hmm. Okay, going back to Teresa again, to, to talk about favourite subject, tax. <laughs> Yeah. So you, as a CPA, what is the tax system like in the US and how can foreign companies navigate it? Yeah, so a company that's expanding into the US um, usually forms a corporation or is taxed as a corporation. And there's a 21% um, rate on net income tax, or I'm sorry, on net taxable income. And it used to be graduated, it used to be a higher rate, I think it's been about five years, still quite a bit higher than Dubai. <laughs> um, but it did, it did come down um, in, in relation to some other countries. Um, in addition to the tax rate, there's other considerations, um, transfer pricing requirements. Um, you need to think about what the role of that company, that U.S. company is going to play in the global transaction, and then the IRS is going to look for that to earn the appropriate amount of profit. So if you're setting up a sales office versus a distribution center versus a manufacturing site, there's going to be different expectations of the level of profit that those um, operations will, will, um, will make. And um, then... To track that, there is requirements, reporting requirements within the corporate return that you have to disclose all of your transactions with foreign related parties. And so that's like the roadmap for the IRS to, to really monitor that. And there's significant penalties even for filing that, that disclosure late. Um, and the last, lastly, there's withholding requirements for certain transactions that the US company has uh, with foreign parties, related or not. And um, really what you need to navigate all of this is a U.S. tax advisor that has the experience with the foreign-owned companies because you're not just filing a U.S. corporate return, you're filing one that has those additional requirements and penalties. And then if I have time, really briefly, um, I think even more complicated for, for certain businesses is the state-level tax. Um, especially if a company is going to be selling to customers throughout the U.S. or employ people throughout the U.S., um, the state tax could become quite complex. You have 50 different sets of rules, <coughs> different types of taxes, um, most commonly income tax and sales tax. And um, the, 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 the state tax arena is just becoming more and more complex. It's moved a number of years ago from physical presence to, 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 to determine taxability, which is clearer than what is now an economic nexus. So who, where the location of your customer that you're selling to and the level of sales to that customer is going to depend on whether or not you're taxable in that state. So it's harder to track, it's harder to determine, and there's more and more. Um, it's just going that way. Everything's becoming economic nexus. Um, also, states are very getting very aggressive in their collection, and some of the trends are not going in taxpayers' favor. Some simplification measures might eliminate a graduated tax, but doesn't eliminate the burden of compliance or the, the, the variation in rules. So it's just an area that uh, for 
for some business models can be very complex. And again, to navigate that, um, you really need a process to have ongoing nexus evaluations, and that's what's key to that is tracking the right information. If you're a accounting system, um, you can only pull a report on sales based on the bill to address. Um, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna be good enough. You need to have quick access to sales by state based on the shipping address. So just simple things like that, but the key is to put those things in place right from the beginning. So it's very important to get to know people like you then, Teresa, <laughs> if you're looking to go into the US. Finally, I'd like to introduce Steve Burson, who's currently located in Singapore, but has also worked and managed his business in Japan. Um, and he comes from the same sort of perspective as Marie, worked in uh, destination services. That's right, yes. So what problem or barriers might someone come up against when looking to expand into your location and can you also give us some solutions to those challenges? Yeah, I guess uh, coming from a, a visa and immigration uh, perspective, I think uh, there's a, a lot of nationalistic or more nationalistic nationalistic uh, sentiment now um, coming out of COVID. You know, countries are really um, making it more difficult uh, for companies to get, uh, you know, visas, working visas yeah. for, their, for their people. Uh, so a lot more labour testing um, for example, um, it takes a lot longer to get that, that working visa. Um, yeah. So we're seeing a lot of those challenges in a lot of our countries around Asia. Uh, yes. Definitely in Singapore, um, you know, there, there really has been a crackdown and, and maybe um, some of that has resulted in what, uh, you know, Maria is talking about um, <laughs> with people moving, moving to Dubai. Is it, it, it is becoming a bit of a challenge. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, countries, you know, really like Singapore, taking Sing Singapore as an example, really, um, you know, they do want to bring in new businesses. Yeah. Um, Singapore in particular in, in the tech and IT space. Uh, so there are organisations like Enterprise Singapore, um, which they call ECG, uh, ESG, different, different ESG than we've been talking about here um, during this conference. But um, ESG is really, um, you know, are keen to bring in new businesses to, you know, to Singapore. And so using those, um, you know, those investment type vehicles, uh, you, will, you will get well supported and at least get, you know, enough support to get your business um, up and up and running. Um, and then it's probably going to be important in most locations to, you know, to employ locally um, so that you can continue to, to bring in, uh, you know, people on, on working visas and things like that. So, yeah. yeah. From my own experience, I think we, we set up in Singapore in uh, 2007. It was easy to set up the company. Very easy, online practically. It is still very easy <laughs> to set up the company. It's just it's getting more and more difficult to yeah. to employ uh, foreign. Yeah, well, you know, this foreign is the problem I'm having currently. Trying to find staff in Singapore, it's very difficult at the moment. Yes, yes, and business is very vibrant. Um, you know, Singapore with the geopolitical sort of um, you know situation we see in, in you know Hong Kong and, and China being quite closed due to you know zero yeah. COVID. Yeah. Um, things really are ramping up in Singapore. So uh, yeah, things are very hot. So lots of people, when they think of Asia, they think about China. Um, they tend. What's your take on the best location to have to base yourself in the region, apart from China? I guess it really exactly. depends on the, the industry you're in, but but Singapore probably has to be one of the you know the the, the best locations to base your business uh, yeah. in Asia, um, mm -hmm. and using that as a hub to then to then you know move move into other other countries. Yes. Uh, maybe the dark dark horse there is Japan. Um, although Japan's corporate tax scheme is is not quite as competitive as you know say Singapore or Hong Kong. Uh, but the good thing about Japan is, you know, that there are no, um, you know, um, there is no limit on how many um, foreigners you can bring into the country. Into right. the country, the, the visa and immigration process is quite open. It, it yes. takes a lot of time to to get people through that process, but yeah. um, definitely, um, you know, locating your your business in either you know a, a location like Singapore or Japan, where the you know the countries are politically stable, um, and then. Yes using that to, you know, to, to move into to, to other countries. Yeah, I think one of my challenges in Japan was finding the right type of partners. I sort of third time round, I found the people that were the people that did the best job for me. And now I'm very happy, but it took a while. <laughs> it does take a while, but I think increasingly Japan is, is becoming more global, more open to those, yeah. the, those types of partnerships. And we're definitely seeing a lot of, um, you know, Japan and, and foreign co collaboration. Um, and through that, a lot of, um, you know, an influx of a good influx. Of, of people recently. Yeah. So 
I'd like to come to you all now in turn to ask you, what's the key final message you each want to get across? So should we start with you, Daniel? Oh, well, uh, nothing that uh, has not been said. I think uh, in, in, in our region, it's very important to obtain a, a, a 360 degree uh, advice. You know, um, sometimes uh, you can have a, a, a good advice on the immigration uh, area and you will relocate the, the the employee and, and, and uh, obtain its working uh, visa and everything, but that not necessarily will be complying with the employment and labor side or the tax uh, 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 aspects of, 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 of hiring. So um, again, since the beginning, no, if, if you're going to set up a company, uh, what are the requirements, what are the best structures, who, who, who have to be the, the shareholders of that company in order to take advantage of all the tax treaties that, that, that the country has, you no? Know? And, um, and again, it's, it's a global advice, you no? Know? It, yes. It, it's very, very important. Thank you. Steve? Much of the same, really. Uh, you know, plan and consult, I think, and, and you know, use the, the, the Centuro network to, you know, yeah. to get as much uh, advice as you can on the locations that you're looking to, get, to go into. And, and don't assume it's going to be easy, because it's, uh, a lot of the time it's <laughs> not, and that's, and that's why you're going to need help along the way. Yeah, I think um, Centura Global is a great way to connect with different people. I'm certainly going to, I'm a new mem going to be a new member, but I'm certainly going to use it. Yes. <laughs> uh, Teresa? I think um, my advice would be to uh, don't rush into decisions without the information. Um, also, don't, don't jump to a, a, the lowest cost solution without really understanding your needs. Mm. And I think just using that information and, and leaning on, you know, U.S. resources um, will put you in the best position to succeed. Okay, thank you. Marie? Yeah, similar to what Anna said, I would say definitely don't go for the, the lowest cost solution. Um, and, and one of the challenges with the UAE and that we spoke about as well is opening corporate bank accounts. So when you yes. go with the cheapest free zone or free, <laughs> a cheapest entity to, you set up, you won't be able to open a corporate bank account. So, you know, sometimes cheaper can actually end up a lot more expensive. And we That's see right. that with clients that don't listen. And then they have to set up a second entity for their corporate bank account. So definitely do your research, get expert advice um, and take your time as well. Thank you, everyone. Um, that's all from us. Has anybody got any additional questions they'd like to ask? Well, I think we're finished then. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>